Welcome to One Sky, a special presentation of Heartbeat Alaska, a forum for Native issues and concerns. One voice, one sky. Hello and welcome to One Sky. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so much for joining me. On today's program, we take a look at the history of the Museum of the American Indian. We'll see in part, part of a documentary entitled Legacy in Limbo. The Museum of the American Indian is located in a four-story neoclassical building at 155th Street and Broadway, just north of Harlem in New York City. Inside are the treasures of a hemisphere, the legacies of hundreds of Indian nations and cultures. The collection is valued at more than a billion dollars, but it's priceless, really. The artifacts could never be replaced. The scope of the collection is staggering, from A to Z, Aztec to Zuni, and from 14,000 years ago to the present. Barbara Conable is the chairman of the museum's board of trustees. He spent 20 years as a Republican congressman from upstate New York. An Indian scholar, Conable was recently named president of the World Bank. Our collection encompasses all Western Hemisphere natives, from Tierra del Fuego to the Arctic Circle. And we don't really have any serious blind spots in our collection. It's, uh, it's over a million pieces of magnificent uh, cultural artifact. The immensity of this collection sets it apart and above all others. But it's also the museum's biggest problem. 46,000 items are crammed into just 15,000 square feet of display area. The remainder of the million artifacts are locked in a storage facility 12 miles away in the Bronx, where the public is not invited. Inside, priceless artifacts are virtually piled one on top of another from floor to ceiling. The museum has simply run out of room. Further complicating matters, the museum's library is in yet a third location. Anyone who would look at it now would say it's totally inadequate and for the largest and most important ethnological collection in the world, uh, our current facilities are pretty close to a disaster. While each of the major museums in New York attract about 40,000 visitors every week, the Museum of the American Indian is lucky to get 40,000 visitors in an entire year and it's not hard to figure out why. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney, Guggenheim, Cooper Hewitt Museum, and several others are all located along what's known as Museum Mile. Stretching from about 75th to 95th Street, this is one of New York's most exclusive neighborhoods on Fifth Avenue along the east side of Central Park. Bus and subway access is easy, and it's a safe, clean neighborhood. By contrast, the Museum of the American Indian is virtually alone as a cultural institution in Upper Manhattan. It's a long subway ride from the glamorous museums downtown, and then you're left three blocks from the museum in a rundown, high-crime neighborhood. In eight years, I've only had one car stolen and two others uh, ravaged. It is not a safe neighborhood. Uh, local political leaders don't like me to say this, but I'm simply uh, able to observe what happens here. The police in the 34th Precinct in answering a call last year where we'd had a break-in in the basement of the museum, said when they left that the 10 blocks north of 155th and Broadway are the worst 10 blocks in New York City. This precinct has the distinction of being the precinct in New York that has the highest incidence of murder in New York City. When this was broadcast on the evening news about a year or so ago, the next day we had 15 people in the museum all day. When Dr. Force came to the museum in 1977, his top priority was to find a new home worthy of this great collection. We tried to secure um, a location here for more than eight years, to no avail. There was no help forthcoming from government, from private foundations, or individuals. Now, that means you have to keep looking, and we did. 
In early 1985, the Board of Trustees contacted H. Ross Perot, the Texas computer billionaire, and asked for his help. Perot has a reputation and the money for quick, decisive action. He personally financed an attempted rescue of POWs from Vietnam. And in 1978, Perot masterminded and financed the Rambo-style rescue of two of his employees jailed in Iran. They came to me and said, we need to uh, build a new home for our museum and we need to endow it. We need $40 million to build a home, $30 million to endow it. And I said, fine, I'll underwrite it for $70 million. And that basically means that if nobody ever put in a penny, I would see that all that got done. All the museum had to do to get Perot's $70 million was move to Texas. New Yorkers were outraged. City and state officials charged Perot was trying to steal one of their cultural assets. The New York City Council even passed a resolution trying to block any move by the museum out of New York. The American Indian Museum is a very valuable resource, and we've got to keep it here. And this attempt by H. Ross Perot to uh, spirit it away down to Dallas, Texas, is something that should be rejected categorically, and we've got to do everything we can to keep it here. The angry rhetoric escalated. Some city leaders charged the museum with bad management and staying poor so that the Perot offer would look like the only alternative. Museum officials countered with charges of neglect and arrogance. New York had given no support, they said, and just wanted to avoid the embarrassment of losing a major cultural asset no matter what is best for the collection. Do you think uh, that uh, if Texas had a uh, comparable museum, uh, that Ross Perot uh, wouldn't be saying, uh, if that museum were seeking to come to New York, uh, we're not going to let it go? You think uh, we would say he's arrogant? Or would we say uh, that uh, he wants to uh, protect a cultural resource of that particular state? Are we to do less than Ross Perot would do under similar circumstances? What's wrong with going to Dallas? Leaving New York State is a sin. It's also probably illegal. Probably illegal, Governor Cuomo suggests, because of the trust document that established the museum. All these artifacts were at one time the private collection of a single man, George High. The High Trust turned his private collection over to the public Museum of the American Indian, which was to be located in New York State. It is that provision of the trust that this museum was created for the benefit of the people of New York that is at the heart of the controversy. It's to be uh, chartered under the laws of the state of New York. The board of directors are to meet uh, twice a year in the city of New York. There are to be filings with the secretary of state of New York, financial filings, reports. It's to comport with the laws of the state of New York. So uh, there's a very clear intent on the part of the person who created this institution and created the trust. And it's my job to protect those interests by making sure that that trust indenture is not violated by allowing uh, this incredible, incomparable, irreplaceable collection to leave the borders of the state of New York. George Gustav High was born in 1874 the sole heir to an oil fortune amassed by his father who had worked with John D. Rockefeller. High grew up in New York's upper-class society and graduated in 1896 from Columbia University as an engineer. Until that time, High had shown no interest in Indians. His first job in 1897 was supervising the laying of railroad tracks in Kingman, Arizona. Mr. High told the story uh, himself that one day after work, he had walked through the Navajo encampment and came across a woman who was seated on the ground chewing the seams of a rawhide shirt. He was intrigued by this, stopped and talked to the Indian woman, and apparently ended up buying the shirt for $5 and was never the same. Later, High wrote about the incident. That shirt was the start of my collection, he said. Naturally, when I had the shirt, I wanted a rattle and moccasins. And then the collecting bug seized me and I was lost. The collecting bug became an obsession. High spent the next 60 years and all of his $10 million fortune, plus four or five million kicked in by friends, amassing the biggest collection of native artifacts from North, Central, and South America. The collection includes such historic items as Crazy Horse's war bonnet, Geronimo's rifle, and the Penn Treaty wampum belt which was given to William Penn in 1683 to mark the purchase of land that would later become the state of Pennsylvania. 
High researched Indian cultures, hired the best anthropologists of the day, and financed numerous archaeological and collecting expeditions. When the Europeans arrived, they called the Western Hemisphere the New World. In fact, it was an old world with scores of ancient and advanced civilizations. These duck decoys were found by museum anthropologists during an excavation in Lovelock, Nevada in the 1920s. We all thought they were 1,000 years old, but then we ha actually had them radiocarbon dated recently, and it turns out that they're over 2,000 years old, which is very exciting and wonderful. It makes them the oldest known duck decoys in the world. And in fact, their date actually predates Julius Caesar and the Roman Empire. That so gives you a bit of perspective of what was going on here in the New World as well. The Paiute Indians are still making duck decoys in much the same way. The craft has been handed down unchanged through a hundred generations. There are conflicting interpretations about what motivated George High to amass such an incredible collection. You have to understand um, the climate of the times that George High was collecting in. He was collecting in the early 1900s when it was literally thought by educated people that Native Americans were either going to become extinct, epidemics were wiping them out, or that they would become so totally assimilated that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between an Indian and a um, European or American. So they were collecting these artifacts to have a record of this, um, this lifestyle. Others claim High really didn't care about Indians as individuals, but that he simply found something he could do bigger and better than anyone else, that he bought all these objects for the sheer pleasure of possessing them. An anthropologist who worked with High was quoted as saying, if Stamps had caught and held his fancy instead of Indians, he would have bought himself the Postmaster Generalship. Regardless of his motivation, by 1906, High's collection had outgrown his apartment. He rented a succession of lofts throughout Manhattan to store his artifacts. Several museums wanted to acquire High's collection, but he wasn't the least bit interested in losing possession or control of his prized hobby. In 1912, High went off to Panama on one of his frequent collecting expeditions. When he returned, he found his wife had locked him out of their house and filed for divorce. Apparently, Mrs. High was fed up with the clutter of Indian artifacts in their home. Hai could keep his collection, or her. Hai chose the collection. By 1915, Hai's collection was overflowing even his rented space. A solution was offered by his friend Archer Huntington, a scholar and heir to a railroad fortune. Huntington owned the land at Audubon Terrace in Upper Manhattan. He wanted to rejuvenate the deteriorating neighborhood by creating a major cultural center for the study of the humanities. Huntington offered land and money to the Hispanic Society of America, the Numismatic Society, the American Geographical Society, and the Academy of Arts and Letters. Huntington made the same offer to George High, if the private High collection would become a formal public institution. High needed the space. So he agreed. A personal reaction of mine is that it was not a good location, even in 1916. It was far from the centers of activity in the city of New York. Moreover, it was far too small, a building on a plot that could never be expanded, so that there were things wrong with this location from the very beginning. Indeed, by the mid-20s, the collection had outgrown the building. Huntington gave High another six acres in the Bronx for a warehouse and research branch. Later, Huntington gave High still more land in the Bronx to house the museum's growing library. High remarried in 1915 to Thea Page. The new Mrs. High not only tolerated her husband's obsession, she enjoyed it and even spent some of her own money to sponsor archaeological digs. <laughs> From 1917 to 1923, the museum excavated the village of Hauicu, near what is now Gallup, New Mexico. The Spanish explorer Coronado believed Hauicu was one of the seven cities of Cibola, one of the legendary seven cities of gold. 
The archaeologists unearthed literally thousands of artifacts, exquisite pottery and utensils. Some of what they found is on display at the main gallery, but most of the items from Hawiku are stacked on shelf after shelf at the research branch. It was a beautiful village, multi-tiers of uh, apartment-like homes made out of stone and mud, uh, very nicely kept. It was a very thriving village and supposedly the most important one in the Zuni region at that time. And the descendants of the Hawaiku people are the contemporary Zuni Pueblo people today. And they're very interested in this site, as you can well imagine. George High was not content to sit at the museum in New York waiting for the archaeologists to send back more treasure. He went out into the field and actively participated in the excavations. At one dig at an ancient Indian burial ground in New Jersey, High and his entire crew were arrested for grave robbing. High fought the case all the way to the New Jersey Supreme Court and won. He commissioned collecting trips and other ethnographic research through the early years of this century when there was no National Science Foundation. When uh, other institutions like the Field Museum and the American Museum of Natural History and the Smithsonian were sending people into the field, George High was doing it as a private citizen. High pretty much withdrew from the New York society circles and devoted all his time and energy to his collection. He sponsored digs, went to auctions, and traveled the world collecting Indian artifacts. He made more than 50 trips to Europe, many for the express purpose of buying Indian items from the old explorers. High began a series of cross-country trips where he would stop at town after town looking to acquire Indian goods. High was known to literally buy the clothing right off the backs of Indian people. And it's been said he purchased entire villages, leaving nothing but, quote, naked Indian people holding handfuls of money, unquote. Carmelo Guadagno worked for George High for 10 years and then stayed at the museum for another 25 until he retired in 1982. As a matter of fact, sometimes there wasn't uh, so, much, so many things coming in that we had to put uh, some of these crates down in the basement. The only thing is we could not open up a single crate without Dr. High being there. So all we did was just store them temporarily until he came, and then literally he got in there and enjoyed unpacking, you know, ripping papers and getting at things. And uh, so uh, he, he just enjoyed it. It was, it was like opening up a Christmas box for him. I could see the, you know, the, 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 the the joy in his face, you know. <laughs> of course, now these things were his, you know. During George High's lifetime, the museum was only open from 2 to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday. It was closed Saturdays and Sundays. He didn't care about the particular, uh, I mean, spectators coming into the museum. He wasn't, he didn't care if five people came into the museum or 500 people. He really didn't. It was his collection that counted. And a place to store them, and a place to store them properly. High only opened the museum to the public because he had to. The tax laws required it. When the stock market crashed in 1929, High lost most of his money, and the future of the young museum was very much in doubt. High was forced to let go most of his staff. But always the obsessed collector, High used his remaining cash to buy up other collections, forced onto the market by the Depression. This museum has thousands of Indian baskets from a hundred different tribes. Some are hundreds of years old, some contemporary. Some are very large, others so tiny that three would fit on a dime. This basket from the Pomo tribe in Northern California features the tiny feathers found on the front of a quail's head. There is only one of these feathers on each quail, which makes these baskets extremely rare and valuable. They have heard about a buffalo robe. But to see so many, it's overpowering. And indeed, uh, strengthened my resolve to uh, make sure that uh, we would fight tooth and nail uh, to uh, prevent uh, that museum uh, from uh, leaving uh, the uh, state of New York. Prior to seeking help from Ross Perot, the Museum of the American Indian negotiated for three years with the American Museum of Natural History in New York, which has about half a million Indian artifacts of its own. The idea was a loose affiliation that would provide the space needed and an accessible location while maintaining the Museum of the American Indian as an independent entity. 
The Museum of Natural History offered to build a new 200,000 square foot facility adjacent to their own and help raise some $30 million. But trustee George Abrams, a Seneca Indian, says the space offered just wasn't enough. They need 400,000 square feet. The space being offered, uh, first of all, is, is not adequate for the needs of the uh, Museum of the American Indian. While it's a, a greater amount of space that we currently have now, um, it still is uh, insufficient for our needs. And um, there's also the question of um, autonomy. We would prefer to see our own separate identity continuing uh, as a distinct people and not be swallowed up with the dinosaurs and all the rest of it. To sweeten the merger option, Governor Cuomo and Mayor Koch each pledged $13 million in aid. But the $26 million was not offered to the Museum of the American Indian. It was offered to the Museum of Natural History, only if the merger takes place. These are tough economic times. Uh, sure. Where's the city going to come up with $13 million? We're committed to it, so you don't have to worry about it. That's part of our capital budget, which is not uh, under the same tensions as our operating uh, budget. There is no problem. And the state is committed uh, to the $13 million, and we are committed to the $13 million. Why not offer that money to keep them independent? Well, one of the problems that uh, you have uh, is that based on the track record as it relates uh, to raising operating expenditures, once you have your own building, the American Indian Museum does not have a very good track record. The trustees say if they had a better location, to say nothing of the $26 million offered to the Museum of Natural History, they could demonstrate a good track record on their own. They point to a 1984 exhibition at the new IBM building in downtown New York as proof. The show ran just 52 days, but in that high-profile, accessible location, it attracted 115,000 visitors. That's more than three times the number of people that visit the Museum of the American Indian in its present location in an entire year. The museum also points to a similar success with a 1978 temporary exhibit at the Custom House. Located at the foot of Manhattan near the Financial District, the Custom House is in a safe, high-traffic neighborhood, and it's easily accessible with the Bowling Green subway stop right at the front door. We've had foundations tell us, we're not going to support you as long as you're up there in that remote location, but you get the Custom House or another prominent location, and we'll support you. So it's a catch-22 for you. Absolutely. After you rode ashore, we'll send you a lifeboat. Despite the need for massive and costly renovation, Dr. Force is convinced that the Custom House would be a perfect solution. It's in New York, and that satisfies the trust provision. It has over 400,000 square feet, and that satisfies the museum's space needs. And most importantly, Force says, the museum could remain independent. The Custom House is sitting empty now, but it's owned by the federal government. It would require special legislation from Congress to transfer the building to the Museum of the American Indian. Still, that roadblock could be hurdled, the museum believes, if New York politicians would get behind the idea. I would much prefer to have the support of the state and the city for the Custom House. It can be great for that part of town, great for that building, great for the city, great for the state, great for the nation, and great for Indians. This is Native News Across the Nation. I'm Gary Fife. The National Museum of the American Indian has taken another major step toward becoming reality. The museum has just opened its facility in the old Customs House building in New York City, and it got its largest cash donation ever. The Customs House unit is part of a plan for three major facilities for the museum. Besides that unit, the museum will occupy the last open space on the mall in Washington, D.C., and it will have a major research and storage facility in nearby Maryland. The Mashantucket Pequot has made history by donating $10 million to the project. The Connecticut tribe is using profits from its successful gaming operations. The Chickasaw tribe of Oklahoma... Thank you so much for joining me on One Sky. Please start thinking about getting the video for our Christmas one-hour presentation on Heartbeat Alaska. Once again, I'm Jeannie Green. See you next week.